Good morning. I'm really impressed with you to add that this is a full house in the early morning. I have my phone on because I'm recording it because there will be a piece in the FT. So, Ed, 11 years ago, Ed had written another book. I think his third by then, he was 30. And I went to interview him at his local restaurants in Notting Hill. And I think the only time I've ever interviewed a sportsman, he was then We became friends. It's never happened before or since. And writing about sport, you often feel that you're in this kind of mire of stupidity. You go to the press conference and you can't believe what people are asking and what the manager is saying. And I got out of sports writing partly because of that. It was making me more stupid. <laughs> there are a few people in sport to whom that totally doesn't apply. Arsene Wenger, Billy Bean, and Ed, I think, would be the prime ones I would highlight. So, Ed, great cricketer, played for England. Uh, long story. Uh, great writer. I put him up there with Nick Hornby and Roger Khan in the Plimpton in the Pantheon. And now chief selector of the England team, which won the World Cup and is now engaged in the fourth test, I think that's right, against Australia. Ed, firstly, they're playing at Old Trafford today. Why are you here? Okay, that was... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, now you mention it, I, I can get a helicopter. I mean, the, the, the truth is, um, I'm here because uh, I massively admire Simon as a writer and a man, and I admire particularly what he writes in the FT. And the interesting thing about um, selection for me, which is never something I, I thought I would do, it, I had no ambition to be um, back in sport, but Andrew Strauss asked me to consider it. And one of the things that excited me about selection uh, was one of the themes of Simon's writing, which is how can ideas have a positive and elevating effect on a practical sphere, often sport. And 10 years ago, around about the time uh, I met Simon, he wrote a brilliant series, a series of pieces for the FT about Barcelona number fours and about the sense of a tradition, the sense of an idea, an ideal as well as an idea of how a sport should be played and how one inspirational figure, Guardiola, inspired by Cruyff, could actually go about making that uh, dream into a reality. Now, cricket's very different. Um, and it's not that perfect an analogy at all for what anyone in cricket can do because the constraints are so much greater. However, I have been uh, for a long time interested in, in how ideas can shape the real world. In terms of, of why am I here, 95% of the time I'm at the ground. Um, and the reason I go to the ground to watch, partly because you pick up a lot um, from watching what happens off camera. By the time it gets to a television screen, it's already been mediated. A producer's always already trying to shape what he wants you to feel as well. I think you watch a lot. Uh, you get a lot from seeing interactions between players that don't make to the, uh, to the camera. Uh, and secondly, for a much more banal and um, negative reason, which is that when you're at the game, you're, in, you're at an event which improves your behavior. Um, as well, when you're at home, you're just a middle-aged man shouting at a television. <laughs> and last year, um, so the two de days I've actually not been there, one was the day when we beat India at the Aegeus Bowl and secured the Test Series last year. And the other was actually the Ben Stokes Day, which we'll come to in a second. And so the first day uh, last summer, and my daughter, who was two at the time, just at the moment that we won the series, just sort of waddled into the room and said, looked at me for a bit longer than you'd want a two-year-old to look at you, it's quizzically, more like a parent than as a child, and said, hope, daddy, feel a better soon. <laughs> uh, I thought, what kind of noise are you making that elicits concerns from your two-year-old daughter? Um, so that's one reason I'm normally at the ground, and then and and, so, and and also I think you get you do get stuff as well as the interactions at the end of play and in the morning where you might actually you know speak to coaches and players. Also, much more significantly, I think you watch. Simon uh, told me a, a story about Barcelona that if you only watched the game, you wouldn't necessarily see Busquets, but if you watch Busquets, you see the whole game, which I think one of his managers said. And in the same way, it's the interaction of people unobserved non-captured by television, which often tells you the most. You retired from playing 10 years ago, horrible ankle injury, and then you became a kind of intellectual. You have written beautifully about sport. You teach sport at the University of Buckingham. I've spoken at your courses. 
And it seemed that you were drifting away from kind of participation. And you were saying that when you came back in as chief selector last year, it turned out those 10 years had been a preparation. Why? Sure. I think you know, one of the... Uh, I'm not someone that believes in planning a life. I think you do the best you can, put yourself in the way of interesting opportunities. When you find something engaging, keep doing it. When you don't find something engaging, try and get out of it. Um, and I had no plan, really. I'd always written from, from 20 to well, 40. I'd, writing had always been a part of my life, but I hadn't really understood the thread necessarily that went through that experience. For a while, I tried not to write about sport because I wanted to keep my sports life as a player separate, but then they converged naturally and I kind of gave up that rather prissy idea. Um, and then in, I think in my 30s, having retired at 30, from 30 to 40, even though I was wearing a number of hats, as Simon said, I think what I was actually doing was two things, trying to make sense of my 13 years as a player, not through introspection, but through inquiry, what actually makes a difference in sport, and then secondly, asking the question, you know, where were people uh, using critical thinking to find an advantage in sport? Obviously in American sport, which has much more money than any other sport except football, but also in football and tennis as well. And I followed those places that inspired me, um, and often I wrote about them. Um, I never knew then, when I was doing it, I just thought I was writing an article or writing a book. I never knew then that it would would come together in any practical or useful way. But I think as a selector, without consciously trying to draw on anything, I just think your experience informs how you go about making judgments and decisions. And I think all of that, um, that decade has had some, some practical value. Yeah, you study both the players and the coaches very closely with the benefit of having been in their shoes, which can be a benefit if you're intelligent. And so when I interviewed Federer, you gave me a great briefing on Federer. Yeah. Now, you'd, you've written a book about cricket and baseball. You're a tennis nut. You follow football. You mentioned Guardiola. What is it from Guardiola, for example, that you've tried to bring to selecting an England cricket team? Well, I, I t look at two selections that I think were both bold and interesting or deselections, you know, one was Guardiola's decision to move on from Joe Hart. As the goalkeeper as the of goalkeeper. Manchester City. Um, not because Joe Hart isn't a good player, of course he'd been a, a stalwart for England and for Manchester City, but because his vision of football requires 11 footballers who are comfortable on the ball. And he perceived that if he was going to do the job to the best of his ability, he had to be true to his principles and his ideals. So he made the change there. Now, what's interesting about that is actually not so much the application of ideology, which I don't think is as relevant to cricket, where there are more constraints and no transfer market. <laughs> but I do think the fact that he would have known when he made that decision that there was going to be a backlash because Joe Hart is widely admired and liked. And of course, English journalists were going to find him very available. And there were going to be a lot of sit down pieces about how baffling it was and blah, blah. And there's going to be noise. There's going to be noise that every time the new goalkeeper makes a mistake, especially fails to save a goal, that it's going to be a failure of ideology. It's going to be Guardiola's mistake. So he's, he's owning an awful lot of complex noise. And he says it's worth doing because I believe in it. Second selection, um, even more controversial, was Warren Gatland, Lions, Wales and Lions coach, fantastic coach uh, of Wales and also the British Lions, when he leaves out a truly great player, Brian O'Driscoll, and plays Jonathan Davies in the center and wins in that Lions third test match. Now, again, what's interesting about the selection, there's a, there's a rugby judgment going on, which we won't get into, but there's also a certainty that this is going to create a huge backlash. And everyone's going to have a say. And the match, the whole lead up to the match is going to become dominated by that selection. And if it goes wrong, there is no doubt whatsoever what people will say went wrong. Even if the causes of the act, of, if there had been a defeat, would have been probably much more complicated and nuanced, but it's going to be one person did it, and it was Warren Gallant. Of course, he wins, 
and you know, survives the storm, more than survives the storm, the storm becomes a central part of his strength. So I think when you want to make a decision and you believe it to be right, and you're also aware that there's going to be a backlash, that's an opportunity as well as a threat. Um, and there have been some examples where that's happened. Further to that, it doesn't mean, and the, the great thing about both those selections or deselections is that they were not contrary. They were controversial, but not contrary. And Howard Marks, the investor who, who is a friend of mine, you know, tells the joke that just because most people think it's a bad idea to stand in front of a bus and you're a contrarian thinker, doesn't mean it's a good idea to stand in front <laughs> of a bus. <laughs> and you have to think carefully about the moments when you diverge from conventional wisdom. And if you rate yourself as someone who is prepared to challenge conventional wisdom when it needs to be challenged, you also should know the moments when conventional wisdom is right. Um, so really, if you ask, what is selection? How would you, in you know, investing terms, you know, what is alpha? Ha it's what are the moments when your judgment diverges from what would have happened anyway? That's what selection is. And that's things like choosing three spinners uh, playing three wicketkeeper batsmen, yes. uh, doing things that are unconventional, and if you lose, you get punished. That's right. So, and of course, the interesting thing is that when something unconventional goes well, it quickly, conventional wisdom being the shrewd beast that it is, quickly gets swallowed into conventional thinking. And when you do something which is unconventional and does not succeed, people remember it as being very quirky and uh, worthy of criticism. So, you know, for example, um, you know, the first decision that I was involved with, um, the old selection panel endured for a while, and I was the only change. So usually I would refer to, we make a decision, and there should be no sort of um, gaps or, or sense of who made it. It's just a we, the selection panel made it. In this one instance, I'll say it was, I clearly had a big hand in it because the other selectors had not done it before. Um, which is the recall of Joss Butler. Now, you know, it turned out that, that Joss Butler had a phenomenal, has had a, a, an exceptional spell over you know, two summers and a winter, and hopefully that continues today. But at the time, you know, a lot of, uh, most people, I think, wouldn't have made that decision because the convention is that if you're not playing championship cricket or Red Bull cricket, you shouldn't or aren't in the right place to, to play test cricket. But as schedules have become so chaotic and, and congested, those types of traditions are, are not always possible to honor. So for example, now, um, you know, there hasn't been much championship or four day cricket in the past few weeks. So you know, in some ways you're dealing with that new reality of players being incredibly busy and stretched across different formats all the time. So yeah, I think they're the examples, and again, you know, in Sri Lanka, England played three spinners. And the ultimate decision, I should say, by the way, is that even though the selectors, myself, James Taylor, who's been a brilliant, brilliant person for England cricket to have involved again, someone who, by the, time, by the point he became selector, he'd captained England three years previously as a 25-year-old, then as a 28-year-old, after his heart um, problem, came back into England cricket as a selector. And he's been absolutely brilliant. Um, we are responsible myself, James, and the coach for the squad, the squad of 12 or 13 at home or 15 or 16 abroad. And then it's the captain in consultation with the coach who has ultimately res ultimate responsibility for the final 11. So I give Joe Root a lot of credit for this too. But the decision to play three spinners in Sri Lanka, which has never worked up until then in the history of England cricket, directly led England you know, to win that series three win the first time they'd won three nil in Asia since the early 60s. So yeah, those are the, the, the moments, I think, when, when it's exciting. It's when you're diverging from conventional wisdom. And if you can't diverge from conventional wisdom and improve on it, don't try. That's a big lesson as well. Yeah, that's a temptation for a clever boy like you to come in and say, well, I'm more clever. We see this, I think, in government now with a, an advisor to Boris Johnson. <laughs> I'm, more, I'm more clever. So everything they've always done is wrong. And uh, I'm going to throw that away. Do you feel that temptation? Well, I don't feel that temptation because I'm sufficiently 
I think there's a, a balance that I do feel very much of cricket in that I was a county cricketer mainly for 13 years and I have many friends who are still in the game and ex-colleagues are now some of them still playing um, and some of them are coaching by the way I should say that one of the funniest stories I, I heard reported back to me was a conversation between Stuart Broad and James Anderson so Stuart Broad's 32 James Anderson is 37 uh, even though they've played so much together there is a, a significant age gap there and Stuart said to James do you, do you know Ed at all, James? And he said, I played three test matches with him. <laughs> so that, that was Ed, how, Ed's that's test match great, unfortunately. That, was that's right. how old I, you know, that's how, how, how long Jimmy's been playing. He was 20 in 2003 and I was 25. So you still have those, that, the fabric of your relationships and your friendships, which very much informs who you are inside the game. But then also you've got your, your life and your ideas outside the game. But, uh, you know, both work together. And I think it would be impossible to be a selector without having lots and lots of people you trusted and could talk to about the grassroots of county cricket. And obviously, I think James Taylor is absolutely exceptional because he's a peer. Never before in the history of England cricket selection has the person who's been, in, been involved as an independent selector, full-time selector, actually been on the field with all the people that he's making decisions about. So that's been a massive asset. So I think you, you, yeah, you must try to grapple with where is there a problem which actually can't be easily solved just by a bit of smart thinking? And that's a structural problem. And we've got those too in cricket, definitely. That's where lots of people have tried solutions and they, you know, it doesn't matter what you throw at the problem, it's still there. For example? Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, structurally, we have some challenges in this country, in, you know, weather, we, we have a, a, you know, it isn't always easy to predict from county performance exactly what will happen in international cricket. So, and sometimes that correlation is stronger and other times it's weaker, all sorts of other things. And then there are moments when actually, you know, there is a, an opportunity to say, look, let's really look at the question again. Let's try and recast the question and see if we can have a more imaginative solution. But it's a big mistake to think that you can always think your way out of a problem because sometimes it's not that simple. I mean, in a sense, you deserve to be appointed chief selector, but because of English tradition, you were appointed chief selector because you'd been to Cambridge. 10 of the 22 <laughs> England chief selectors of the last century, I think, were Cambridge cricketers originally. And so people like you and Mike Atherton and Mike Braley have also been fast-tracked on the field because of that. And this causes this class tension that players versus gentlemen has never gone away from England cricket. Do you feel I that? Dis I disagree with that. I think the opposite. I think that was clearly the case once, and then the opposite became the case. I think an actual fact that an accurate reading of the relationship between sport and class in this country has been that the long shadow cast by the amateur hegemony actually caused an overreaction against anyone that looked like he might have once been in contact with an amateur. So um, there, are two th there are two problems with that. First of all, that there is a uh, suspicion of joy and self-expression, which we're getting out of, by the way, but I think that's been a problem. And secondly, there has been a sense that if it appears that it might be entitlement that's leading to an appointment, there's, a, there's a, uh, almost a, an anxiety about going anywhere near it. So far from it being the case that it was privilege that led me to become a selector, it, although luck, clearly, because I would, when you've written a book called Luck and you've examined all the ways in which you've had undeserved um, opportunity, which I have done, obviously I would say I've been lucky in many respects. But I don't think anyone thought that the next selector was going to be a Cambridge-educated person in that tradition. I think it was a very left field thing for Andrew Strauss to do. And I think the only reason uh, that it happened was because he's actually interested in, in doing things differently than if he believes in them. And I think we saw with Andrew's um, preparation for the World Cup that that was a very rare example in British sport of a properly strategic, a, a proper strategic plan where Andrew had won as a captain the, the Ashes home and away, but no England captain or coach had ever won the World Cup. And we'd never really 
in the modern period, in the World Cups he'd played in, he would say we never really went into them thinking we were going to win them. So his ambition was to arrive at the World Cup as favourites and the number one ranked team in the world. And then he's smart enough to realise that then there's uncertainty and and all the rest of the things that happen in, in tournament play. It turned out that England did win the World Cup. Yeah, um, were you there? You had better things to do? You, you followed the bread on right. Facebook? No, I, yeah, exactly. I, was, I wasn't at a, uh, an FT event that day. Um, mm. It was actually, it was an amazing occasion at Lords, and obviously we've had so many remarkable days of international cricket in the last few years. I think that one was remarkable because from the point of England losing the fifth wicket, so when uh, Stokes and Butler come together, fourth wicket rather, there's, there's an understanding in the ground that this is the partnership. And so that 100 stand, the crowd's ability to sustain concentrated tension <laughs> And just to get it just right, when there was a moment of risk that came off to celebrate it, but then to almost return to that controlled attention. And for, for Joss and Ben to play with such control and skill for such a long period of time in very difficult circumstances, that was a remarkable spell. And then I think the very end was perfectly summarized by Joss immediately after the game where he said, no idea what happened there. All a bit crazy, you know, and that's I think what what everyone felt from the moment of the of the overthrows. You think, well, you know, I no longer seek to understand. I'm just following the story now, and and there's no rational expectation. And Owen Morgan said it brilliantly as well when he said, you know, he'd been in touch with Kane Williamson, the New Zealand captain, who behaved so brilliantly as he always does, and his whole team did. And there have been so many mad moments in that in that match that it, it, it almost, it would be a disservice to the game to, to try to explain it, I think. Well, it's a great exemplar of the luck story. So in 50 years time, people say England won the World Cup, whereas we can see the, the randomness of it. Ed has agreed to go on to 11 very graciously. So I'm gonna ask a couple more myself before I open up to Q&A. Um, ben Stokes, you missed the Headingley day. You must have a view on Stokes. I missed it, I have watched it. Yeah, I, I, look, I think, um, I was there days one, two, and three. I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, I think there are moments, aren't there, in sport where athletes go to the very limit of what they have. Um, Simon mentioned earlier on that I'm a big tennis fan, and I've been a lot at a lot of those great finals. And what you are in awe of at the end of those Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, Nadal finals, Murray, is the sense that no one deserved to lose and that both players were being taken to places that they had never been before. And so it wasn't a question of who wanted it more. They're both teams absolute champions. And I think what we saw in that Headingley game was that Stokes... Ben Stokes was, that was his, you know, everything he had as a brilliant athlete, as a great competitor, as a highly skilled player, <coughs> converging in one incredible performance. Um, and they're very, very special, aren't they? And there is a, a, a hint of the sublime about days like that. And for those of us that are always alert to the fact that sport can occasionally be about something very deep um, and moving, that was a special day. Um, and for obviously the, arguably the greatest one day game to happen within six weeks of arguably the greatest test match and for the protagonist to be the same in both occasions is, is a remarkable story. But it was very, very moving, yeah. Last question for me before Q&A. You've written about Bradman. Bradman was way better than anyone else. And you say in this excellent book, What Sport Tells Us About Life, it's much harder to stand out now because there are so many good players because of professionalism, etc. Mm. Is Steve Smith and is Messi mm. 
are they exceptions to that? Are they Bradmans of our time? They're just much better mm. than the rest. Like most ideas, it's borrowed. You know, Stephen Jay Gould made the argument that um, the reason no one hits, hit, hits point four hundred in baseball anymore is because the worst players got a lot better. So basically, uh, it's harder for the Giants to stand so far ahead of everyone. Not because they're not as good, but because... Uh, the average player is so highly competent. And then, of course, there's all the analysis work that opposition does about players' strengths and weaknesses that makes it harder to, to just run away with dominance, if you like. So Stephen Smith has been you know, remarkable, and his sequence in Ashes test matches over there and then over here, it's been absolutely remarkable. And he's obviously playing at a level... You know, and it is... The word Bradmanesque is to be used very, very carefully, but clearly he's approaching that territory in this sequence where there is no discernible weakness um, that can be consistently exploited. There are mistakes, everyone makes mistakes, but there is no thread to them that, that any opponent has been able to identify and exploit. So that's, uh, that's a remarkable achievement. Um, obviously, We've also lived through an era of, of remarkable footballers and tennis players too. One of, the, one of the really exciting things about cricket at the moment is that cricket's going through a period of rapid change and I think hopefully expansion, hopefully it grows and, and we get more people playing cricket than ever before. As that happens, I think we will see um, more of those types of players. I think we've seen it a little bit with Virat Kohli, A.B. de Villiers, Stephen Smith, our own Joe Root, and I think as they continue to push the boundaries of what's possible, I think cricket's entering a very exciting phase. I'm going to take two or three questions in one go, and please can they be brief. Uh, gentlemen over here, and, and then, then Miranda, yeah. Right, right. And then you. One, two, three, yeah. Uh, please, brief. Yeah, could you say something about the scoreboard pressure? Why can a team get 300 in the first innings and not manage it in the fourth? Okay, second question. We can take all three in one go. Uh, second question over here, please. This lady here, yeah. And then uh, you, yeah. How many miscreants can you have in a team? How many Danny Cipriani's, Kevin Peterson's, Kevin Ben Stokes? Um, handling egos, how do you deal with the ego of the person you don't select? And how do you break that news to them? Have there been any challenges? So in order, the major reason uh, to do with fourth innings chases is that pitches tend to change over a period of four or five days. I think if a pitch stayed exactly the same, I think people would chase down very high scores. And that's why in one-day cricket, scoreboard pressure has effectively, you know, not disappeared, but is not talked about in the same way because the pitch doesn't change. Um, in terms of uh, mavericks or people who are, are different, there's no number and there's no quota. The key question usually is, you know, how good and how difficult. That was the way I always used to frame it as a writer, is that one of the less good questions is, was X dropped because of off-field stuff or was it because of on-field stuff? Well, in actual fact, nearly always, it's a, a calculation of both. That someone who is truly remarkable as a performer is often tolerated more than someone who is a more marginal pick. Now, that may not sound fair, but as Eddie Jones, the England rugby coach, puts it, the further you go down the list in terms of ability, the more their character and teamsmanship, if you like, becomes a relevant part to their selection. Um, breaking news to people, I've just spoken to Simon about that over breakfast, um, there's a great line in, in the Italian film, The Great Beauty, that you wouldn't want to be too practiced. It's in a different context. Um, but I think it applies to lots of important things in life. I think that I don't believe in technique when it comes to having difficult conversations. I believe in authenticity. And I think that you have considered, you the decision maker, have really grappled with the decision and that you've thought of all useful lines of inquiry about how you might have approach that decision, that you have access to all relevant information, and that you've justly weighed the decision in its entirety, those things should communicate themselves to the person you're talking to. And it should, it should just be 
obvious. Uh, and therefore, you should have no anxiety about the conversation. And I think that if you really do your work, if you really do your work, your thinking time, if you're really grappling with every decision, the conversation itself, although it may not be easy, should not induce anxiety. Ed, uh, Simon, FT Weekenders is a very remarkable moment. Uh, uh, I've never actually had to edit Simon before. This is the first time I'm going to edit him. His column normally arrives just like that. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop here in the interests of England cricket because we want you to watch <laughs> now, Ed. That's okay. where you need to be. That's right. And also in the interests of the next session. So, Ed, we'll have you back when there isn't a test match because we'd love to hear you speak for longer next time. Thank you both so much. Well done,